This is Dr. Susie Mira podcasting from UCLA Radiology, Los Angeles, California. Podcast number 14 is going to be presented by Dr. Cindy Wei. Her topic is CT evaluation of the placenta in traumatic injury. Hi, this is Dr. Cindy Wei. I'm a first-year resident at UCLA Department of Diagnostic Radiology. Today, I'd like to talk to you about CT evaluation of the placenta in traumatic injury. This was work done at UC Irvine, along with my colleagues, Dr. Helmy and Dr. Alan Cohen, who is also my mentor. And this work was published in Emergency Radiology. Traumatic injuries affect 6 to 7% of all pregnancies. Maternal fetal complications include placental abruption and preterm labor. CT scanning in pregnancy has so far been limited because of concerns for teratogenicity and childhood cancers from radiation. As a result, there have been very few CT studies done on placental anatomy, normal or abnormal. In emergency situations, CT scans are useful because they are faster than MRI and also they are more comprehensive for studying the abdomen, retroperitoneum, uterus, placenta, and fetus than ultrasonography. Photos radiation protocols make this more acceptable for use in pregnancy. As the number of CT scans done for the evaluation of trauma increases, there is a need to study placental anatomy by CT scan, and that's what we've set out to do. Our goals are threefold. One, to demonstrate the appearance of the normal placenta at different gestational ages. Two, to show CT findings of placental injuries. And three, to improve detection of placenta abruptions on CT scans. In our study, we looked at consecutive CT scans of the abdomen pelvis from 66 pregnant patients who came to UCI Medical Center from March 2003 to May 2008. Of these, 22 were non-trauma scans and 44 were trauma scans. Any studies done without IV contrast were excluded. Next, we reviewed medical records to verify that abruptions had indeed occurred. We also determined the normal appearance of the placenta and identified difficulties in evaluation of placental abruption. To do this, we compared the performance of the original dictated reports with the accuracy of two independent reviewers. One of the reviewers was a senior reviewer, and another reviewer was a trained reviewer who had been trained on all the non-trauma CT scans and then tested on the trauma CT scans. This is a table of our clinical data. As you can see here, of the 44 trauma scans that we had, we had seven positive placental abruptions, or 15.2%. In the non-trauma cases, there were no placental abruptions. This table is a summary of reviewer performance. As you can see here, in the original dictated reports, only three out of seven placental abruptions were detected, for a sensitivity of 42.9%. When reviewers were told to look for placental abruptions, their sensitivity was 100% but their specificity had dropped a little bit with the false positive of around 17 to 20% versus 10% in the original dictated reports. These are some examples of normal placenta during the first trimester. Early on at five weeks, the appearance is very homogeneous and there's a smooth chorionic plate. Later on the development of the placenta, you can get some chorionic hemorrhages which appear more heterogeneous, but they're of no clinical significance. So here are the images again of five weeks. The placenta is not distinguished from the uterine components. And you can see no evidence of a fetus here. At 10 weeks, the placenta is a little bit more heterogeneous and there are subchorionic fluid collections developing which are demarcated by the white arrows. And pretty much the same thing at 12 weeks right here. This is an example of questionable placenta during the first trimester. This patient had originally come in for trauma. On the CT scan, you can see a large subchorionic fluid collection here, as pointed by the red arrow. Incidentally, there's a finding of a right ovarian cyst. At this time, the patient was deemed not to have a placental abruption. However, seven days after the scan was taken, the patient experienced vaginal bleeding and spontaneous abortion a collapsed gestational sac was confirmed by ultrasound. 
So in this case, it is unknown whether the abortion was caused by trauma or by a pre-existing condition. Now these are some examples of the normal placenta during the second trimester. The features of the placenta during this time include increased heterogeneity with IV contrast enhancement, myometrial contractions may be seen, and also later on in the second trimester, multiple placental cotyledons may be seen. Now I'm going to show you some enlarged images. At 13 weeks, you can see that the placenta is already well delineated from the myometrium. The myometrium doesn't take up contrast as much as the placenta and therefore is hypodense to the placenta. Here at 19 weeks, there's an increase in the placental uterine thickness in this image. And this is caused by a contraction of the underlying myometrium. The myometrium is less dense and can be distinguished from the overlying placenta. And again, these are the placental cotyledons. These are some images that demonstrate the normal appearance of the placenta during the third trimester. So at 33 weeks, the CT scan shows increased heterogeneity of the placentas compared with the second trimester, as well as the formation of these chorionic plate indentations on the fetal side of the placenta. Also, you can have increased venous lakes on the maternal side of the placenta, which are shown as these hypodense areas within the placenta. And these are blow-up images of the chorionic plate indentations and the venous lakes. These are all part of normal placental development. Now I'm going to show you some examples of false positives. These two images represent myometrial contractions. And because the myometrium is less dense than placenta, it can appear like ill-perfused placenta that you would see in a placental abruption. However, if you examine the angle between the placenta and the myometrium, these angles are more likely to be obtuse. This is an enlarged image from 14 weeks of the myometrial contraction. And again, you can see this obtuse angle between the myometrium and the placenta. This is also demonstrated in the second image. Other entities that may be mistaken for placental abruptions include venous lakes, shown here in the blue arrow, and also placental infarctions during the late third trimester. These infarcts become more frequent as the placenta matures, but they're usually clinically insignificant. These are the enlarged images of the venous lakes and the placental infarcts. Now let's move on to placental abruptions. An abruption is a separation of the placenta from the uterine wall, which may be partial or complete. Subsequent bleeding and hematoma formation will further separate the placenta and the uterine wall, which will then cause compromise of blood flow to the fetus. Usually this is a clinical diagnosis, and you should be suspicious for this <clears throat> if the patient is experiencing vaginal bleeding, abdominal pain, uterine tenderness, uterine contractions, or if there is fetal distress. Now I'm going to show you some examples of classic placental abruptions. All three of these images represent the classic appearance, which include a large area of poorly perfused placenta adjacent to an area of well-perfused placenta. Here you can see that the angle between the poorly perfused and well-perfused area is acute, unlike the case of myometrial contraction, where the angle between the poorly perfused area and the well-perfused area is an obtuse angle. These are the zoomed in images of the placental abruption seen on the last slide. Now I'm going to show you some examples of missed abruptions. This is an example of an abruption that occurred at 21 weeks. The original report did not mention the placenta's appearance, but did suggest limited OB ultrasound to evaluate the placenta. However, if you look at the image, it's very apparent that there's a large area that is not well perfused. And if you look at another slice from the image, you can see that there is a retroplacental hemorrhage that is undermining the placental tissue. So this would be 
an obvious abruption that was missed because the placenta was not systematically evaluated. One of the features of placental abruption is the development of a hematoma in the retroplacental position. However, sometimes these retroplacental hematomas can get so large, as you can see right here, that they can mimic the myometrium underlying that, and therefore you would miss abruption. In this case, no comment was made on the placental appearance in the report. This is another example of a missed abruption due to a large retroplacental hematoma. This occurred in the early third trimester. The original dictator report stated that the placenta's interior demonstrates heterogeneous enhancement and that there was no subplacental hematoma identified. When, in fact, if you look very carefully, you can see that there's an undermining of the placenta by a large space occupying density, which is similar to the density of the myometrium. Our data suggests that a systematic evaluation of the placenta in all pregnant trauma patients would be beneficial in helping to improve the sensitivity of detection. Secondly, we encourage everyone to continue to review scans which are positive for placental abrasion and also normal scans showing the normal placental anatomy. From our data, we've shown that it's preferable to lower the threshold for calling placental abruptions. Any abruption involving more than 50% of the placental surface has been frequently associated with fetal demise and therefore it's important to identify these abruptions. If the CT scan is unclear, one can correlate with fetal monitoring data. However, ultrasound and other blood tests are of limited utility. So again, we stress the importance of being able to evaluate for placental abruption on a CT scan. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation of placental abruption. And again, I would like to thank my colleagues at UC Irvine, Dr. Cohen and Dr. Helmy for making this research possible. And also I'd like to thank UCLA and Dr. Susie Muir for making this podcast possible. Thank you. Please visit our pediatric imaging wiki site, http pediatricimaging.wikispaces.com for additional podcasts and also interesting pediatric and adult cases in all imaging specialties.